Gabriel, can you make sure that Alex is? Yes. Good night. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are we good? All right, let's go ahead and call tonight's meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. We'll call all members of council are here and present. Approval of tonight's agenda. There's a revised agenda in front of you. That includes a added item. It would be the approval of the revised agenda. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve the revised agenda. Hearing a motion from Councilor Haugen, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Lasowski. All those in favor? All those in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Public comments. Uh, it looks like we've got a few people with public comments. Yes, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for those of you who are joined in this meeting on your telephone, uh, the first person we had up was Justin Creek. He submitted his comment in writing. Uh, those on the phone, you'll need to enter star six on your phone to unmute yourself. So, Justin Creek, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Can anyone hear me? I can hear you. Okay, uh, if everyone can hear me, then I will get started. Uh, first off, my name is Justin Craig. I am the I'm Scappoose's union representative for Tualatin Valley Firefighters Union IAFF Local 1660. I was born and raised in Scappoose and graduated from Scappoose High School in 2007. I started as a volunteer with Scappoose Fire District and I've worked as a full-time firefighter paramedic for the past five years. I'm pleased to speak to you tonight on behalf of the men and women who proudly serve as firefighters, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, for Scappoose Rural Fire District. First, let me pass on an important message from all of us. Thank you. Thank you for your past support and your willingness to support additional funding so that we can better serve you. The members of our community call and we come as fast as we can. However, there are times when the Scappoose main station is only staffed with one ambulance. This means an ambulance must come from another community when there are multiple calls. This takes time. A fast and reliable paramedic response and transport to the emergency room is critical to the survivability in the event of a heart attack, stroke, cardiac arrest, or significant trauma. When an ambulance must come from another community, this critical care is delayed. The levy on the current ballot will provide the residents of Scappoose Fire District with a faster and more reliable response when there are multiple medical incidents, as well as residential and commercial fires, motor vehicle crashes, and other emergencies. This will be achieved by retaining all current staff, as well as hiring three additional positions. This will allow the fire district to staff two ambulances or one four person engine company 24 hours a day. Your support for this levy will allow us to better serve you. Please join us in voting yes for measure 5285 and help us provide you with faster, more reliable EMS and fire protection services. Um, that's all I have, uh, unless the council or anyone else has questions or if it's allowed. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Creek. The 
next person is Mr. McSweet. I believe that is Carol Sweet. Uh, oh, Carol Sweet. Carol? It is Carol Sweet. Yes. Hi, Carol. Hello? Hi. <laughs> McSweet, I like that. A little Irish. Anyway, um, I am com uh, doing a public comment. Um, I would normally be there in front of you. And maybe we would like to put this on the agenda down the line. But I just wanted to give you a heads up that there is a citizen law enforcement committee starting up, which will be countywide. And um, I have been going slowly through the pandemic rituals, reaching all of the city councilors, the mayors, the police chiefs, everybody. Um, and we feel that it it has to happen. Um, it is not going to be like we're telling the police what to do, but it's more of a committee where citizens can come to get information from law enforcement and law enforcement can get information from us. It started back in the Black Lives Matter rally time when we heard that there were 500 Antifa coming in from Portland, which always cracked me up because my parents were both Antifa. They fought in World War II. But anyway, um, we asked some law enforcement people, well, how did you hear this? And they said, on the internet. And none of us could believe that that was how they were getting their information. It turned out it wasn't. And it would have been a lot easier if we could have just had some kind of trusted method where we could talk and exchange information. Also, with all of the things that are going on now, the defund, the police, the do we want to change? We want. It feels like this is the time where citizens need to talk to their law enforcement and um, get exchange ideas. And um, and as, as I told Chief, your Chief. Norm, um, Skeplus will be the shining light on the hill about what to do, but we still need to be part of it because uh, it's countywide law enforcement, and um, and so it's going to be a countywide program. And I've understood from just rumors that maybe um, some people don't like to mix up the county stuff, but law enforcement is something that we all have to do together. And um, I feel like if somebody in, I don't know where, um, Vernonia is upset and they come to a group and say, can you tell me how this works? That makes it better for all of us. So it is, it's, a, it's, very, it's very much in the infant stages. We've got a little, little beginning group of people who are very savvy, who have worked on other police projects. I did for years work for Portland Police as a, community resource person. Um, and I think it's going to be a very positive thing. We've had a lot of changes. We had um, a, a new chief, a new sheriff, and a new head of mental health a couple of years ago, and it really changed everything. And I've gotten all of the players on board. The new mental health person is CCMH person is on board. I've, I've spoken to Chief Greenaway, Norm, the sheriff, um, we're, we're slowly moving towards getting everybody together. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. If you have any drastic reasons why you think this could never work, I'm more than happy to come before you and we can discuss it. Um, or you can give me the, the okay to go ahead and start putting it together and I'll be back to tell you where we are. I know I only had three minutes. That's hard for me to do three minutes of anything. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much, Carol. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and move forward to Marissa Jacobs. And Council, how are you? Marissa? Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, Mayor Burge, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Good evening, Council members. Hope you're doing well. Um, I had an opportunity. This is Marissa Jacobs, and I'm speaking to you as a private uh, resident citizen of Scapoos. 
Um, I had the opportunity to listen to the work session prior. Um, yes, I submitted public comment. However, since then, listening to the work session, I'd like to offer um, some insights to that meeting that may be beneficial to you. Um, I found the work session interesting because I'm an HR professional um, of 20 years, and so I'm very intimate with this aspect of hiring staff. So I found it really interesting that the consulting firm uh, mentioned that they did a community survey. Um, as you know, I'm fairly connected into the community surveys, happenings, whatnots, at least I try to be. Um, I didn't notice that there was any communication outbound, so um, I just would consider that to be a fail on the consulting firm's part, that that communication didn't actually make it out to the community. Um, secondarily, though, uh, the attributes. I think the attribute list that you guys all aligned on, it's a huge, tall list. Um, and I think the main takeaways is really you're looking for someone who is connected, involved, and is um, involved in events and responsive to things happening here in the city. And the conversation regarding where the individual lives came up. And I can tell you that it is okay um, that you can require someone lives within a certain uh, area. Um, for example, I work for a, a currently a corporate comp company, and first off, we're doing all the hiring over Zoom. Um, it's very rare to do any in-person hiring right now, given the COVID situation, but you can make it a part of the qualifications. Um, part of the requirement for the job is that someone lives within limits. Um, you can get as prescriptive as possible. Um, however, I also do think that it is very important for someone that does live within some aspect of close proximity within the city of Jacuz who is close in and can be connected into the city. It's a very unique area. Um, we are not like a big city like Portland. People who move out here don't want to be a part of any big cities. And the people that stay probably are enjoying that it's still a small town. So I think having that element is super important and critical. So I think a lot of the counselors on the call agreed with that. Um, but in terms of how close, you have complete control and autonomy to be able to do that. Um, and I can tell you that shortly as an HR professional. Um, so if there's any questions, happy to answer any questions. Um, but uh, thank you so much for your uh, allowing me the time to speak. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you. There's a Dixie Partee. Dixie, if you're on the line right now, you are currently muted. Please press star six to unmute yourself on your phone. Dixie? So you weren't sure if she wanted to read hers or if she was just putting it in. That's correct. Okay, so I will make the assumption that she was just wanting to have hers in the record. You all have a copy of her email. Let's go ahead and move forward to new business. The first item is Mayor, just what? We have not approved an agenda. Oh, we probably should do that. Huh? No, we did approve agenda. We did? Yeah, we approved the revised agenda. Oh. Motion to buy Councilor Haug and seconded by Lasowski. I am so sorry for interrupting. Yes, Pete. Hey, I wanted to say something about the letter from Marissa Jacobs because I've seen this issue happen in the past. It happened in Clackamas County and the line in 2010 was stop Portland Creek. And that it was that, um, and I didn't know what that meant at the time. I, I found out what that meant. And I think it's really important that you guys know what it means. It's a concept called otherism. And what it is, is that there's a group and then there are others. And the group has certain values and, and morals and certain attributes and the others don't. And the others um, are often said to want to come someplace to cause harm. Um, and, and so you're in one group or you're in the other. And it I've watched it just absolutely destroy communities because the other groups are seen somehow as less human, um, as not belonging. And, you know, it, 
I could give extreme examples of it, certainly what happened during World War II and other times. But any time that you have people choose sides um, based on whatever attribute it is, based on race, based on gender, um, it means you're excluding people and you're excluding ideas. And again, in all the jurisdictions I've seen it happen in it, it created a toxic mess. Um, I am an other because I do not live in the city of Scapoose. Um, but what I would say is that in addition to being a city, Scapoose is a community. Uh, Michael Sykes doesn't live in Scapoose, but he's part of the Scapoose community. Patrick Kessie doesn't live in Scapoose, but he's part of the community. If you care about Scapoose, and I think it's kind of offensive to read in a letter that um, Alex Rains or someone like me wouldn't, because I do care a lot about you and I want you to be successful. And um, I just hope that at least everyone has both eyes open and that we, because during times of great stress, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's cities going through rapid growth or you're having to sprint, then if you, if you go down this road of there's this group that's good and there's this group that's bad and some people's ideas have less worth or they shouldn't be trusted for whatever reason. It just, it breaks like the whole, the whole system, like people lose trust in each other. And instead of working together and working towards understanding, they, um, they don't trust each other and they, they don't believe each other and, and decisions that should be easy become very hard. And that's normally, I only give you advice on legal risk. Normally I wouldn't say anything, but I have seen this otherism of the us versus them be so destructive in communities that I had to tell you what is happening here. Because this is the second week in a row where we have this sort of language that we do not need another out of town worker bringing in their big city ideas. We're not a big city and people living here don't want to be a big city. We're not a big city, we're Scapoose. The vision, the values aren't my vision or values or Alex's vision and values, they're your vision and values. For the policy makers, our job is to ex execute your policy. And of course you love Scapoose. You wouldn't be serving as an unpaid mayor and unpaid city councilors if you didn't. Like you're all here to bring positive change about and we are here to help you do that. Um, and so, I might be an other, but I care about this community and I want you to be successful. Thank you. Yeah. Very well said. Peter, you are not another. I, yeah, yeah. No, just to follow up on that real quick. You know, when I moved here in 1977, I can guarantee you that we would have been a much bigger other had we had California plates and not Wyoming plates. But we were still new to the community. I always look back on that and I always think about that when people, we need to stop people from moving out here. You know, it's getting too big or this, we don't need people from Portland. And I always start asking the question, well, what year do you want the cutoff to be? I mean, you know, what year are they too new? Or, or do we just welcome people with open arms and integrate them into the community and accept their ideas for what they are? You know, if they're, Whoever it is, if they have a good idea and they get the support of the community, it, that's how representative government works. Democracy, you know, you, sometimes it might be a crackhead idea at the beginning, but you have one person with an idea that starts as one person. Years later, oh, that is a good idea based on changing environment of what's going on. So you don't know what's going to change between now, five, ten years. And I think we've tried to always. Welcome people. I know there's some staff that don't live in the community. There's some staff that lived here for decades and then moved out of the community, but still work here. Whole variety of them. But they're very dedicated to this community. And they're very dedicated to doing the job and putting, implementing the goals that I think was important is that this council puts forward. So, and they do the best they can and they try to do it as transparently and as honestly as they can. And, you know, everyone makes mistakes or falls short here and there. But we don't castigate them for that. We try to help them up and 
make them better. So that's my thoughts on that. Anyways, why don't we move forward to the new business? Um, I added the one item. A, as many of you know, last week, uh, former mayor of the city of Scappoose and the Columbia County Court Clerk, Betty Huser, passed away. And I just wanted to have a moment of silence in her honor and then maybe give any member of council a moment to reflect. All right. Anyone want to? I'll say something. Uh, I was Betty's neighbor for 12 years and uh, we first moved to Scappoose and uh, I couldn't ask for a better neighbor. And for quite a while, I didn't know she was the mayor, uh, but she, she was more than just a, a good person. She was kind. Uh, she was, you know, just go talk to her. She was easy to talk to. Uh, my son, Matt, uh, to cut her grass for her and, and we always did a better job cutting her grass than did ours uh, but <laughs> it was just uh, such a good relationship with her and it seemed like whatever things came up uh, she was there to help and uh, just like a neighbor should be so uh, I saw her more as a uh, as a neighbor and a friend than as a, as, a, as the mayor or the county clerk or whatever but uh, you know she 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 lived her life right, and she walked the talk, and uh, she was a very, very honorable person. Uh, I'm going to miss her. Councilor Hogan. Um, follow up on what Pete has noted. Uh, I, I think I knew Betty almost as long as, as Pete did, and truly an extraordinary person, just truly extraordinary. Uh, I, I related uh, going into uh, see her one day uh, here a couple of years ago looking for some information. She goes into the archives and knew where everything was in this ridiculous uh, massive old documents that go back to the 1800s. She could go up and pull one up and, and page through it. It was just absolutely extraordinary. And, and the, the, the service she did for our county and our community is just unbelievable. So the, it, it is so fitting to honor her uh, this evening. Then just one last thing, uh, I talked with her on the phone two days before she died, and she didn't let on. I asked her a historical question, she, and she gives me all these, uh, all this, all this information. And yeah, she said you'll go into archives and we'll 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 fix you up. And, and she didn't let on at all. There was an issue. That's the kind of person she was. It's just absolutely amazing. We'll miss you. So for me, you know, she was mayor of this town for 10 years and you know through the 80s she had some big projects too but she had to work when the highway 30 was widened so it was during that time that they made the decision to separate the library out to its own library district which created a library here so you know her impact on the community as mayor during the, the, that decade was huge and then she moved on to the county i remember Anything you need out of a county clerk's office when it was, we showed up there for as, you know, the benefit of each one of us is that she knows who we are because of the positions we hold. She'd be out front, ready to serve and help you and do above and beyond. And it was great. And it was always great getting, you know, her feedback and support on, you know, being mayor. So she will be missed. Just real quick, I, you know, me, I've known Betty for a long time since I was a little kid. My mom and dad both worked at the courthouse. And so um, going in as a little kid, even seeing Betty, um, she's just such a bubbly and great personality and such a big, strong person in this community. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of, I guess, push this out to you, Pete, but this might be a good opportunity for, for us to kind of commemorate her during the 100-year celebration, if that's a possibility. But yeah, we've been we've been talking about that, too. It's definitely going to be part of what we do. Excellent. Thank you. Sir. 
Um, I have a yearly experience with her. We beg and deliver for sharing care. And before I even was on the council or had even moved back to Scappoose, she was just always so interested in our stories of things that had happened over that last year. And then as our kids were starting to come every year and help, she would chat with each of them and, you know, make small talk about how big they'd grown up. And um, she was just a very hands-on leader. And I think that that's something that we should all take with us, that she was a um, very servant leader and um, led by example. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, sir. Um, obviously, I think for those that have been in this community for a while, we do know the impact and service that that he had provided uh, to not just Scappoose but to our county as a, as a whole. Um, I did have the honor of being sworn in uh, by Betty, and I, I do remember that, and that will be something that I get a hold uh, for the rest of my life. And. Um, I do feel as though if there are other ways that we can honor her service to our community moving forward, I would ask that we keep her name at the top of those lists in a way to enshrine the service that she provided. And my heart and condolences goes out, goes out to the family. Thank you. My story about Betty is very similar, I think, to Josh's because my mom worked in the assessor's office in Columbia County for over 20 years. My mom knows, of course, Josh's mother and parents very well, too. Um, I know Betty from kind of a different point of view because I think when I was started to walk is when I first knew who Betty was. I remember going back that far. And one of the things I always remember is when it would snow, my mom would walk to the top of the driveway because we lived at Dutch Canyon. Our driveway was always hard to get up or down. And Betty would come in her her Jeep, as Pete and I have talked about, she said that Jeep forever, and she picked my mom up. So if there's anything to illustrate how caring Betty was, I think that's just a very straightforward point and in, in the type of lady that she was. Thank you, Council. Uh, next item, the If I Were Mayor contest. So we had one <clears throat> submission, Oliver Schwank, a sixth grader. Makes it easy to win when you're the only candidate. Yeah. <laughs> he also did a good job. Yeah, good yeah, very good job. Yeah, I know. Can I just give him the position? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, why don't we just do a simple one? Just uh, if I can get a motion to declare him the winner of if I were mayor contest in a second, and then we'll move forward with his award in the future. Mayor, Walter Miller. You have something very similar with our uh, if I was mayor candidate. We'll front up those. Yes. <laughs> well, this last time I've had I've had opponents. Okay, this last time. Mr. Mayor, Councilor Lasowski. I move the council um, award Oliver Shrunk uh, if I were mayor contest uh, award recipient. Hearing a motion by Councilor Lasowski, do I have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Polling. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor start state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item, Council Rules and Procedures. Ms. Raines. Yes, Mayor and Council. So this is a follow-up item to a request that was made during the April 5th meeting um, by Council President Gryson. Um, she had broached the subject of comparing our existing council rules that are in Scappy's Municipal Code 2.04 to the league's model rules. So, and then also there was some discussion about the consideration of readopting the rules as a resolution versus having it in code just for ease of being able to suspend them if desired. So what I did was I looked at the LOC's model rules of procedure and I looked at our code and created this chart, which, <laughs> Admittedly, I feel like it's still somewhat confusing. The documents are incredibly different and hard to compare, but I did do my best to point out where the two at least covered similar material. And even when they did, though, I would point out that they covered it in far different detail. You know, you're talking about the model rules, which are about 30 pages long versus our code, which is about six pages. So lots of varying detail in there, but I did try to make it as comparable as possible for your review. And then I also added a note, um, <laughs> that just simply discussed why uh, Ashley Driscoll had suggested the possibility of the adopting the rules as a resolution, as I mentioned, 
generally for the ease of you know, suspending them if you want to for some particular uh, procedural point. So with respect to the ask or the follow-up tonight, uh, we're not necessarily asking to you know, dig into or discuss the details of the differences. What I'm essentially looking for from you all is whether or not you even want to go down this path. So you'll see in the steps for council consideration, you know, there are options to either proceed with doing a deeper dive into this and making some modifications or simply taking no action. So that's that's all I have really to present to you this evening. So if you have any questions or want to discuss any of that, let me know. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Miller, I have a question. Council Miller. So we could, uh, from City Manager uh, Reigns, um, just for a point of clarification. So we could adopt what we currently have as a resolution, or we could take could. it a step further and could. start going in and editing and right so so you have a lot of options you could you could take what you currently have you could take it out of the code you could adopt it as a resolution you could change nothing you could um you know you could go through this you could cherry pick out pieces of the model code that you like update the, update your code take it out of the code adopt it as a resolution leave it in the code i mean it's it's really up to you on how you want to proceed um and even just the options of you know is something staff could take a look at and bring to you. You could form the mayor could form a small ad hoc committee to look at this and just have it supported by staff and a few counselors. You could do it all together over various, you know, over multiple work sessions. There's lots of options here for you. Thank you. Um, I do have a just kind of a follow up um, commentary on this. So this this is here because it came as a question from one of the city councilors, and then um, Ashley Driscoll had. had given some Correct. commentary on it, but I looked back at the minutes from that April 5th meeting and, and Ashley said that she, you know, didn't really understand if there were any issues or doesn't spend as much time with us as say um, Peter does, Peter's here every meeting. If Peter has had time to review this, I would be interested in what, from a, especially from a legal perspective too, and having observed counsel because no, he's here at every council meeting too, if we could get his input on this. Sure. I mean, I I think it does make sense for you to update your council rules. And there the the section that gives me the most heartburn is oh, the like same it. section that gave Andy Jordan the most heartburn, which is 2.04.160, which is that personnel section that has a subcommittee and um when that was used in the past, it created some financial liability for the city. Um, and it, that is a, it is completely unique to, to your city. Um, there's kind of a lack of clarity as to whether that's a um, public meeting or not, because I mean, it's just, it's, Kind of a, a weird process, and and I think it also creates some confusion as to who has final say on on matters. So I think there are a lot of reasons why it probably makes sense to revisit that and have that discussion. As far as the um, model rules go, I am not. I don't like the model rules, um, and I I particularly knowing kind of your style, don't think that they make sense for you they're incredibly prescriptive and very formal whereas a lot of times you guys want something put on the agenda you know um closer closer to it 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 has individual counselors sponsoring ordinances and things of that nature that practically speaking just be incredibly time consuming i think for staff to try and track that down not to mention that if you're figuring out who's sponsoring ordinances kind of signaling prior to the meeting who voting and it kind of looks like a debate and and so that's always something that's given me heartburn there are portions of it that i they're just simply not correct like if you look at the chapter four of the land use hearings so it says that the proceedings shall be de novo and shall be held on the record and, and the problem with that is those are two different standards so a de novo hearing would be when you open it up to all the evidence and on the record is when there is a and you can do de novo hearing as a council on the record is when it's the record in front of the planning commission and they're 
people can't make additional arguments. Um, and then there's a on the record plus if you guys want information on a certain thing. I mean, those are your three options, but there's sections of this, particularly in the land use, where it's simply not how you legally, I mean, on the record means one thing, de novo means another thing. You can't do them both. Um, the other thing too is that I like to frame things in a positive manner. And so I, I've, I've worked with a, I've worked with jurisdictions as small as a Harney County Soil and Water Conservation District and as large as Clark County, Washington. So I've seen a lot. And if you frame things in a positive, I think it creates that, that people believe that the expectation will be that they behave in that manner. So if you say, if you have a rule that says you won't um, use profanity or yell at each other, you're like kind of putting it out there that one outcome is using profanity on each other is if you say we have a culture of mutual respect where we respect each other and, and their ideas and can disagree without being disagreeable. And that, in my mind, you're setting the expectation of positive good behavior. And, and I like to do that. And I've only had one city want to do censures and it was Damascus. And it was, it's like, and fortunately, they decided not to do it, but um, kind of like a kangaroo court where where counselors are suddenly standing in judgment of other counselors and, and are, um, you know, and I, I actually looked through the state statute, state constitution. The only instance of censure in Oregon is there is a, for a judge, there is a process for a judge under certain bad behavior. But I just, I view that is a real negative. Um, I don't think that that's the sort of culture that I've seen here. I've seen a council that, you know, particularly iterations of this council that really respect each other and each other's ideas and are able to work through issues, hopefully. Um, and unless <clears throat> some really, really bad behavior, I can't imagine that you guys would want to kind of stand in judgment of each other as a almost a quasi-judicial body. Um, so those are, I think if we were to use something like the model rules, we would want to go through really carefully and and make sure they weren't process oriented that added a lot of time for staff and also make sure that they really kind of reflected who the city is and the positive, like we can do it together spirit that has been part of the city. So uh, yeah, to, to Peter's point, you know, I, I'm of the mind that you, you don't make things more complicated than you need to. And, and to me, uh, adopting the League of Oregon Cities rules, and, you know, and I respect the Oregon, League of Oregon Cities very much. I, I really do. Adopting those rules I, makes our life a lot more complicated, and I don't see a, a rationale for that. Uh, if we Maybe the resolution approach to uh, Chapter 2.04 does make sense. If that facilitates changes like uh, a 2.04160 personnel, so if that makes sense, yeah, let's do it. But let's let's not kind of throw the baby out with the bath bathwater. Uh, that would be my sense. If you want to change or leave it in the as an ordinance and change it, we can still do that. The making it a resolution just makes it easier to suspend it if for some reason you wanted to suspend any of those rules. The other point I'd make too is that you know. Using the league of, you know, the LOC's model rules of procedure was more of a comparison to or jumping off point. I don't think the suggestion is that we just adopt theirs. I think the idea was that we look at what pieces work for us, if this is even something that you all want to do and make adjustments to your existing code. I don't think there, I don't think the thought was that we just simply toss out what we have and adopt something new. I think it was just to look at what's out there and see if there's anything new we want to incorporate. But again, we don't we don't have to make any changes. And if you want to make it a resolution versus an ordinance, we can do that. We can still make changes to the ordinance. It's just a it's just a more complicated process. So to follow up, Peter, if if we change it over to a resolution, does, does that facilitate making the changes? Yeah, we can. I mean, whatever you guys want, we can do. Um, I I kind of agree with the adopting as a resolution gives you maximum flexibility, and you you as a council are a council that enjoys having flexibility and order to act. So that that makes sense to me. Um, 
I think it's always a good idea to just go through the rules and see kind of what's working and what doesn't. And obviously you guys, you know, but during your retreat, you kind of came up with some concepts for, for that too. And, and that's another document, you know, to look at as we're going through the process. As I said, like the, in my mind, the, the question really is, does it work for all of you and are all of you willing to agree to them? And if, as long as is the answer to both of those questions are yes, um, then, you know, it's, it's what works for you. There are some minimum components that we want to have in there, but um, we do have a lot of flexibility because of home rule. Uh, for me, I guess I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind having uh, Peter go through and kind of, if there's recommendations he would make, because he said that he doesn't necessarily like the league ones, and I'm in full agreement of getting out that 2.04.160, because back in 2001 when it was passed, if you look at the minutes, you'll see that I warned against exactly what happened when it was actually used. And it's it's a political disaster just waiting to happen, and it violates the charter. Be quite frankly, and so I would want to at the very least repeal that. But I would like to see I would like to see suggested changes. I, and I'm trusting Peter because he's been with us for a long time, and he seems to have a good head on his shoulders about this. So I would like to see what suggestions he would make as compared to what the the league standard rules are. And then we can, and that would be kind of our starting point as we kind of look at it. And I'd rather just look at it as short little work sessions as council. That way it's the full council group. It's not a small group so that we can all have our input. Council President. Um, first of all, thank you for taking the time to compare the two and bring us an alternative example yes. of what that would look like. I completely agree that some of it is not fitting for our community. Um, my question for Peter is, we have a city council team agreement. Would you say that if something is, how would you, how would you compare these two in terms of the language that should be on each? So we have our team agreement and then we have, you know, what's written here in our, our we're trying to make, I, I'm just, Sorry, how do we how do we take some of the things that are on our team agreement and add them? Make it a little more firm? Or yeah, I mean I think that available? having you know, some of this, some of the stuff we can codify, you know. I mean we can we can do a resolution that says it. Some of it's just, you know, um, you know, things like always be respectful, maintain dignity and humility. I mean, those are aspirational goals for you guys. And so, um, you know, I've had staff city councils that have gone through their team rules. They read them once a month, you know, at one meeting a month. So just to remind everyone to educate the public on these are the expectations that we have for ourselves and each other. And I think that helps, helps focus people and remind them of what kind of our, what your aspirational goals are, as well as, you know, the role of council and the role of staff. Those are very different, and sometimes people don't understand that. Um, you know, there's some language in there that wouldn't be easy to codify, uh, and so I think it'll just be a mix of, of looking through and figuring out what can be easily added. And then again, I mean, it's, whatever you guys want is really the right answer. And then is everyone just needs to be very honest about whether they'll agree to um, abide by the rules or not. And if, if there are rules that bother you, I mean, the most important thing is to have the conversation um, so that people understand each other's perspective and why they believe and understand what they understand. And as, as long as that honest conversation happens, I, I've seen, you know, I've just seen nothing but positive come out of these sort of team agreements. Um, because councils can change over time and priorities change with them. So what, what was right, you know, in 2001? Uh, well, that section I don't think was right in 2001, but um, but uh, 
what they thought they wanted in 2001, you know, now we've been informed by how that process works or that didn't. And so that's the sort of thing that, that you can tweak. A lot of stuff like the agenda, I mean, it is kind of what it is. It's going to look the same in virtually any city. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can I can work with Alex in order to try and marry some of the concepts from the aspirational goals into the code. Thank you. For me, I feel like um, there's this monster lurking around the corner in some of our conversations that we're having as, as counselors and as a voting body. And I feel like that when sometimes people are talking about certain subjects, um, the level of respect towards staff or other council members, the language that's being used is not of mutual respect or degrading other people's opinions. And that's why I feel like a conversation, as you're saying, that's honest. And maybe we need to be better about in the moment. Like when you say this, it makes it seem like um, just how you were um, so brave today to speak um, after public comment. I really appreciate that. And maybe that's something that we need to hold on to in the midst of our conversations and just stop and pause and, and say what, the, what we feel in terms of what's occurring during that conversation, and then maybe people will be more receptive to how or more reflective on how they are showcasing themselves or how they are um, working with others. I'm just talking it out here, but those are what you said is is exactly why I brought this up is the, the interactions between us as a voting body and the interactions that we have as a voting body and individual members with staff and showing that level of mutual respect everybody in their position. So, yeah. I think sometimes, you know, you see things going in a trend that you're not, this happens to council as much as you, you see things going in a trend or in a way that you maybe don't want and you really wish things would go back to how they were. And that's why I think a really honest conversation <coughs> amongst you is important because things don't feel quite as tight as they you know, once felt um, as far as you guys having each other's backs and, and working through issues in a respectful manner. Um, and I just think that, you know, as, as city attorney, I always view the role of a city attorney as advising on legal risk. And the, my number one gripe with other city attorneys is when I feel like they're pushing policy or telling people they have to do something instead of simply saying, your answer is the right answer as long as you understand the risks associated with the actions. But maybe I need to speak out more if I see something, because um, maybe that's what is needed in this moment. Um, and yeah, I mean, I I am really proud of you guys. And when people ask me about Scapoos, I say Scapoos punches substantially above its weight. And I think that part of it is just acknowledging that for a city your size with the budget and resources that you have, you guys have done really great things. And that it's been a while since it's been kind of a, a dumpster fire, which is when I first arrived. That's how I would describe it is the mayor remembers it. But, <laughs> um, but oh yeah, I remember. And so it's been really inspiring to see watches like the cities come together and as you as a council have come together because other councils were less supportive of each other. And I just, I hope that you guys don't lose that momentum because, you know, on some levels, I feel like there are people that, that want there to be a problem. And sometimes you can snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, and I, I, I don't want that to be the case, um, but I think that, that that probably starts with kind of an honest conversation about with each other and about what things you like and what things you don't like and what things are going well and what are going less. Thank you. So I still think that as far as this is, I'd really like to have Peter kind of make some recommendations to us and bring it back and continue the conversation. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there any determination on ordinance versus resolution or do you want to continue that piece later? Well, I think 
I don't think we want to make that decision today. I mean, I think that I would hope that we're part of that dumpster fire was 0 0.160. So, and it, it does, it, it does something that's really insidious that you don't realize it because it creates a, here's what it creates for the city manager. It creates like this liability storm that they can't control because sometimes they're going to have to make a decision that when it comes to a department head that we may not like, but they have a lot more information that they'll share with us. But for the department head's strategy to say, if I buddy up to four members of council, I'm golden, that's not what we want. You know, we want professional staff that that's not the goal. And you no. Know, and it just it's just too it's dangerous. It it really did not work out well for any of the parties involved. And it just created us just a whirlwind cycle of negativity and I I would love to get rid of that. And I will we'll work on that and we'll bring it back to you during the work session. Thank you. All right, next item Northwest Capoose Connectivity, a presentation by Joel Haugen. Hey. Hey. Uh, you know, first, you know, <laughs> I think it's a follow up on what Peter and, uh, and Megan and, and several of you mentioned. You know, the, it, it's okay to disagree with each other. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, if we didn't have disagreements, there would be something wrong. I mean, uh, I'm sure you and your spouses disagree on stuff and you resolve it, and you come to common ground and, and you move on. And, and, and I think that's, in, you know, we, if we have that mutual respect and, and if we can respect other people's positions on any issue, uh, we're gold. And, uh, and and that's I feel is is, is so essential. Um, and so can I comment on that? I'm going to be agreeing with you 100 percent on this. You know, I think that one of the things we get afraid of is we see what's happening in our world today, where people's idea that if they disagree with you, they have to hate you. You know, and I've been involved in politics for since I was in college, and I was the head of one of the major parties, college organizations statewide, but we would have booths and argue policy. This is where I learned it, argue policy. But you know what? We were all friends and we went and had beers afterwards. I've seen Joel and I have argued. We don't, I don't take anything as long as it's not personal attacks that people are doing. If you're just, we're just talking about the policy. It's good and healthy. We want, I think it gives a good example for the community that's how it should be done. We need to be able to disagree because we don't want to be an echo chamber. But we need to be able to do it respectfully. And that's what's important. Thank you, Joe. Table is yours now. Right. Um, Unless I interrupt you. Uh, so so uh, as, a, as a preface to, uh, and, and here's the, first the good news. Uh, I, can, I think I can do this in five or six minutes. That's okay with you. Um, he, uh, you, you all know that I feel strongly about the, uh, the Gravel One Park, and I've made that abundantly clear, and I've disagreed with Peter and, and probably everybody else in here about this. And, and McHugh and I have had the heated arguments over this. So, uh, but I love Pete. You know? I mean, it's just, it's just the nature of the beast. And, but I, uh, I, uh, and I, and to be, for full disclosure, I reached out to a, uh, a, a land use attorney in, in Portland, uh, who uh, uh, helped craft this statement. And, and all I'm going to ask tonight is to, is to read the statement. And uh, then if you have some questions, fine. Uh, and, but I'm just going to read the statement into the record and, and let it go at that. So the purpose of my presentation today or this evening is one, to discuss the process to date of researching street connectivity in Northwest Scappoose. Two, my objections to option three, the favored local connectivity option. And three, an alternative option. And point two, in January of 2021, the city council hired DKS associates to research options for local street connectivity in Northwest Scappoose. We are well aware of that. 
And item three, EKS Associates looked at three options, creating some north-south connectivity that runs somewhat parallel to Highway 30. The study was called the Northwest Local Connection Study. I am including a page in that study that shows the three straight options. You are familiar with that. Point four, the report says it discusses the benefits of local street connectivity, but it only discusses these benefits in general. The report does not discuss the specific issues that need to be solved or how the options presented solve these issues. For example, is there congestion in the area? Will diverting the congestion through the park solve the problem? Will it create other problems? Point five, the report compared each of the three options against a range of criteria and option three was found to be the only feasible connection opinion, or option, only feasible connection option. Point six, Option three involves a street from Roger Casera Way to E.J. Smith Road to the western edge of the future Grabhorn Park through Scapoose Veterans Dog Park. Okay, next page. Point seven. Option three might have been the best of the three options. This is no way acceptable as a final solution. Opinion. Here are my concerns that were not addressed or evaluated as considered in the DKS report. One, concern number one, livability. Experts question whether a constant stream of automobile traffic is appropriate within a city park. Within a city park. Should we follow the lead of Frederick Law Olmsted in this matter? Writing in the 1850s, Olmsted noted that crowded thoroughfares have nothing in common with the park proper. Everything at variance with those agreeable sentiments which we would wish the park to inspire. The Trust for Public Land recently published an article in which they report that from Baltimore to San Francisco, park agencies are closing roads to cars, either temporarily or permanently. The result has been more visitors in the parks, improved mental and physical health of park goers, and it has saved money and increased safety too. I enclose the Trust of Public Land's article Proceed without caution, city parks are closing their roads to cars for your consideration. <clears throat> number two, concern number two, public safety. Vehicle traffic through parks detracts from the park environment and creates safety hazards for users. Numerous criminology studies also point to increased crime when streets travel through parks. Concern number three, environmental protection. The city and community have been working hard with partners to rehabilitate South Scapoose Creek salmon and habitat. Constructing a one acre plus of road pavement will undermine this ongoing effort. Concern number four, public support. A city is comprised of its citizens and for it to function as a community, it must have the support of the citizenry. It must have the support of the citizenry. The majority of Scapu citizens and neighbors support this proposed street through the park. If not, a new street with traffic through Grabhorn Veterans Park would be an unwise city action, in my opinion. Next page. Concern five, what is the need? EKS report cites general benefit of street connectivity, but it does not state the specific need of, of a specific need or the specific benefits of constructing the proposed option three. For example, what are the specific problems that demonstrate a need for a new street? Is there significant congestion in the area? Will the street through the park alleviate that congestion? Will there be any negative impacts from diverting traffic through the park? The list of considerations goes on and on. I do not see that these considerations have been evaluated. Also, connectivity is achieved through sidewalks, bikeways, and service roads, if necessary. ODOT encourages the use of sidewalks and bikeways for, not for connectivity. Without an explanation of the need for an option three, the benefits and the impacts we are making are making decisions blindly. Point eight, in the event there is a need for additional north-south local access street connectivity, I would like to propose an option four, which has two parts. I believe this option four adequately satisfi satisfies the criteria in the DKS report and also satisfies my concerns above. 
point nine is option four. Part one, connect Northwest First Street to Scappoose Vernonia Highway. Part two, create a wide pedestrian bike path in the pathway of option three, the DKS option three, through the Grabhorn Veterans Park, but chaining it off to vehicle traffic, making it accessible to emergency vehicles on an as needed basis. That chain could be a gate. Again, option four is only to be considered if there is a quantifiable need for another north south access in South Scapoose as determined by commissioning a specific need-based cost-benefit analysis that identifies what traffic problems need to be solved and if the proposed connectivity solves those problems. This is a big challenge, but I believe we must and can do it and continue to make decisions that support, not undermine our very, very special community of Scapoos. In the last paragraph, point 10. I am requesting city council and staff consider my option four as they aim to increase connectivity in Scapoose. If option four is not feasible, I request the city council and staff keep researching other options and not pursue option three at all. Keep Grabhorn Veterans Park free of vehicle and commuter traffic. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Councillor Haugen. Any questions? Yeah, I guess I have a question. It, not about that. I appreciate that report, Bill. Uh, the role of our Grabhorn Park Committee. Uh, I mean, the real issue is do we run the road through or not? You know, we can talk about a whole bunch of stuff, but that's the real issue. And uh, is that something that's part of, I would assume that's part of their responsibility is to take a look at that? Is that correct? I see a nodding yes, and I see a nodding no, and I don't know. Uh, Hill? Yeah, if, if I may, uh, the Grabhorn Park Ad Hoc Committee it does have the latitude to suggest whatever recommendations they so choose to the City Council, so long as they provide recommendations to Council at, at the end of their duration. Okay. So they could address that issue then if they chose to? If they so choose, yes. If it's not part of their assignment, then it's what we're Right. Their their entire uh, responsibility is to provide city council with two recommendations. Okay, and and that's going to be up to the committee as a as a group how they decide to move forward. Okay, right. okay. Councilor Pauling, uh, I you know definitely you know I think look forward to the grab home, you know the committee on what they recommend. I think though you know we also are looking at this road as a separate um entity right because it's it's not just about necessarily the park i think that's what the city's kind of made a recommendation is it, it's not just about the park um what what is you know the, the recommendation of the park will be based on you know needs of the community for the park itself i think you know we need to make sure that we kind of get, keep those together but also make also have all the information that we need in order to decide whether we need that road or we don't need that road as a, as a totally separate from the park and in, in, in that aspect which is i think is a point i, I just articulated and, uh, and you know and the bottom line for me and i've expressed this earlier if the community uh wants a road and and we can afford the road we should build it but if the community is vehemently opposed to it we've got a problem that's what i'm what i'm trying to convey here is, is as forcefully and politely as I can. The second part of my question is, I keep hearing we can afford to build the road, and I, that's the case, I'm, I, I'm glad. But my, I've been told otherwise, and uh, that we can't, we don't have the money to build the road without taking money from sidewalks and some other resources that we have planned to do. It, am I correct there, or uh, is this, we had the money to build the road if we chose to do it, and uh, and this committee gave us permission or whatever. We have the money to build the road without taking away from sidewalks and other projects. Yeah, this, this project is on our list for system Correct. development charges. So, yes, the, so yes, there is plenty of money 
for this particular road. So it wouldn't take away. Okay. There's going to be a driveway that's going to need to be built so that people can access Crabhorn Park. And then there's a driveway in the other park that goes through it. So the cost of connecting the two, we're talking about a relatively small amount of space that the um, that would need to be um, improved and that would the sidewalks that would be required on that road would be built using those same funds. Well, the other thing is too, is that, you know, if the property to the West develops, what, what the city would likely do is set up an advanced finance reimbursement district on that particular portion of the road so that if and when that develops and they tie in, then we're reimbursed for the part of the road that they're using. So it's not, it wouldn't delay the third place sidewalks going in uh, to Grant Watt School? Not the third place. Well, I mean, so and this is just to make sure it's clear. The funds in the system development fee area can be used on any listed project that increases capacity, which means any new sidewalk that's being built, we could, in theory, use system development fee charges or the monies in that fund. So you could make the argument that and this isn't, I'm not taking a side on it. I'm just saying that you could make this argument that by using system development fee money for that road at this time, you're prioritizing that road over sidewalks. And it's more, it's because the money's there. It's like the money's in your bank account for something. You then prioritize it. But, you know, what would be saying is that this connection is more important than that sidewalk. But that sidewalk is, my understanding, is being paid for mostly with the additional three cent gas tax money. Well, we're a ways away from right. that. Well, but, I mean, at this yeah. point, the the conversation that was had with when you know, the public works director was here. Sure, the mic, please. Sorry, um, when the public works director was here was that, you know, Old Portland Road would be completed first. Um, it was the least expensive option, and we could complete the infill of sidewalks on that. Third place in buying because they weren't funded with the Safe Routes to School grant. They're just going to take a little bit longer to do. But again, yes, that the idea was that the three cent gas tax funds would cover those. Um, right now, I think we're getting about two hundred fifty thousand a year off of that, which is a little bit less than what we had hoped for. But that's just the impacts of the pandemic and less people driving. Your trans transportation master plan. It only contemplates that um, that the system development charges pay for half of the sidewalks. So it lists certain sidewalks. Certain sidewalks are eligible for those funds, and then 50% of the cost of those sidewalks can be paid for using the system development charges. The other half of it have to be covered using either state or local gas tax dollars. Or grant some other dollars. Or grants, yeah. Councilor Miller. So can I just frame this in a way that I can understand? So we don't like have a line item budget that's budgeted for that road. We just have basically a fund that we can use money from to develop that road. Correct. Yes. Okay. Councilor President. And just so I understand, the ad hoc committees focus during their meetings is a design plan for the park. It's not a conversation about a road or a no road or they could I mean I'm just I'm just double checking or wanting to make sure I understand that the ad hoc committee's focus really for us helping us decide on a plan of development for the park in terms of amenities and access and um but if they do propose, if they do give us options, one has roads or some don't or whatever, that that's just part of their but their scope is not a discussion on road or not road. That's correct. The ultimately the only scope that was of importance when that committee was put together was two options, one with a pool and one without. Um, if they decide to Approach the subject of the road, it remains to be seen. We're only having now the second meeting mm -hmm. of that group later, excuse me, later this week. Mm -hmm. but generally, I think your assessment is correct. 
Well, I mean, you know, ultimately, I mean, the decision could be, I mean, you know, like Joel with the thing, there, there could be a point where today we only decide to build the road into the parking lot and then it's a walking path or bike path. But at so, some future council could then say, you know what, we need this road. I mean, that's, I mean, that's really a reality that we have. I mean, I don't think there's any way that planning commission could justify the property owner I mean, it's the uh, west of Graphorn property to build that extension because it is entirely on our property beyond that part of the road. So that, that decision will be wholly a decision that either this council makes or a future council makes. And just because this council makes a decision one way doesn't mean a future council won't make the decision another way. But again, thank you, Joel. Well, thank you for listening to me. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. I have a comment. Okay. So on um, concern number four, public support, um, I think that in most circumstances, when it requires, you know, funds, you know, like fuel tax or we want a pool or not, you know, we're, those require money. And so right now we have a pool survey out testing the waters on how people feel. I think it's really important because I'm hearing a lot of different very um, varying opinions, um, strong in both ways. Um, but that sometimes there are decisions made by council that can't always be vetted by the public. That doesn't mean that we don't acknowledge their opinions or that we disregard them, but that sometimes there are occasions where a survey or, or asking people face to face or door to door, it's not, not always the case. It's not Part of the process that, that we can take. So, um, you know, there's things that have occurred in the city that, you know, sure, I wish I were asked on, or I like that it's by my house, or, you know, no, probably not. But there were, there's sometimes just decisions that, that need to be made. And I think that something like this that's in our master plan, or, you know, various other things, I have so many comments that aren't constructive to the conversation, so I'm not even going to go there. But the point is that sometimes we just have to make the decision and it can't always be vetted. You would never raise water rates. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again, Jill. Thank you very much. All right, why don't we go ahead and move forward. Calendar check. Our next council meeting is on Monday, May 17th. Work session at 6 o'clock, city council meeting at 7 o'clock. Every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., there's an ad hoc 100-year celebration committee meeting. Uh, this Thursday at 6 p.m., we have a Grabhorn Park ad hoc committee meeting. The 13th, a planning commission meeting at 7 o'clock. The 20th, uh, Skeppy's Parks and Rec committee meeting at 5.50 p.m. And a Grabhorn Parks and ad hoc committee meeting at 6 p.m. Alex, do you have anything? Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, I just wanted to let you all know that the pool survey, as you all know, is out. Um, it's been online since about mid-March and will be in the newsletter twice. It's also on the app and that'll close around June 3rd. And do you have an update on how many responses we have? I Last time I checked with Isaac, which was on Thursday, we had received just over 200 responses. Um, about half of those had come in electronically, uh, the other half in their paper format based on the other surveys we've done in the past uh once we reach the 350 responses that's really good let's get a quick question in regards to that how do we ensure that it's um <laughs> one survey per resident great question um so there's one uh, option uh, that that's possible. So, so everybody who submits one electronically, right? It you, you know on our end we see the IP address that it was submitted from, right? So, and for those of you that don't know, an IP address is like your internet connection's physical address. Um, so, it just is an indicator, right? If 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 we received thirty surveys from the same IP address, that would be highly questionable. Um, 
again, you can't account for every, you know, someone misusing uh, or, or trying to skew the results of, of, of a survey. Um, I do know on, on, as a question on the survey, we ask, do you live in city limits? And we have gotten a, a you know, not significant, not insignificant uh, percentage of the surveys have come back from outside of city limits uh, um, respondees. Thank you for that, Huel. I just wanted to make sure that there was a mechanism in place for us to at least be able to understand how those responses were being provided. So I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm sure, obviously, you're all aware that the counties have moved back into the extremist category, unfortunately. Um, and then finally, uh, I just, I know that I had spoken already with Joel and Pete, but uh, Travel Oregon did not award us uh, the grant for the mural project. They said that they received over 400 applications and $18.5 million in funding requests and only had about a million to distribute. So didn't go our way. Oh, we got one anyways, the skate park. Yeah. It did, yes. Super great. It's great. <laughs> so that is a good point. Anyway, that's all I had. Thank you. Chief Miller, you have anything? The press re release in front of you, uh, we've had a bit of busy weekend. Um, all the officers and deputies that responded that night uh, did a phenomenal job. I'm very proud of them and that to contain the situation and um, basically stop it without incident. Uh, well done. Uh, and that still an ongoing investigation. So this is all I can share right now with this. Uh, the second thing is, is um, I worked with Peter a long time. We go way back. And that, and I always give him a bag time because he's long winded and I just want him to get to the point. <laughs> so I want to move on. But uh, I like to say, Peter, well said tonight. Um, very proud of you. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Miller. I feel like we accomplished a lot at the city council meeting for some reason, just the discussions that were had and uh, just the overall feeling that I had. I feel like this is probably one of our most successful city council meetings. And um, I attribute that to uh, Peter's commentary. Peter, thank you. I echo what Chief Miller said. And um, some of just the other commentary too. Thank you. Hi. Sir, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Michael Curry was a big part of that grant. And even though we didn't get funded, his willingness to support the community in the city uh, is very, very commendable and, uh, you know, and I'm sure we'll find other ways to keep things going, but I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, that we have really fortunate to have him working with us, and, and uh, so we appreciate that. Also, if I've offended anybody by anything I've said, I apologize. <laughs> I really think this is about as fine of a group of people I've ever worked with, you know, uh, and I, I just am very, very proud to be part of this part of this group. And the last thing I want to say is. Uh, uh, Peter, thank you very much for your comments because I read those two reports and I didn't know what to do, didn't know what to say. I wanted to say something. It was very offensive to me when they uh, uh, say things about employees that don't live in the city and, uh, and make assumptions. That they don't even know these employees. Uh, and if they were here uh, and saw how hard they worked and how dedicated they were, they would never say anything like that. Uh, and I just want to know that I, I appreciate you standing up and saying what you said, because I think it made a big difference. And also, Chief, nice job with all the uh, activity you had and down there on Walnut Street. So I appreciate your good work. Thanks, President. Um, yes, I just wanted to start off with, with Peter as well. I was leaning under this mask. I felt like there were so many things that I've wanted to say about some public comments that have been made as of late, um, some that weren't even uh, spoken tonight, but are in written form in front of us, or you know whatever it is. And um, I'm very proud to work with you. So thank you. Um, thank you, Norm, and your team for everything that occurred. Um, I just want to encourage the public that wherever you stand with the pool. Please um, share your thoughts and fill out the survey. It's just really important feedback for us. 
you're not, uh, this is not us posing a tax. You're not going to receive something on your next, you know, round of taxes. This is us just trying to get as most, much information as we can because we do want to know what the public is interested in. And we know that the cost is so heavy. This is not a light decision for us or you know, the process that we take is so important in knowing how they feel. And then the last thing, um, I have a letter and a little gift speaking on behalf of the Grant Watts Parent Organization. And they would like to thank the counselors for their generous and meaningful contribution to the Scapu Sprouts Learning Garden this year through the Community Enhancement Program. They were honored and overjoyed to be the recipients of these funds last summer. And since receiving that Community Enhancement Program funds, they've been able to successfully build an incredible outdoor mobile classroom at Grant Watts Elementary. The space is wonderfully complete with a large learning cabinet loaded with supplies and six sturdy outdoor rolling tables that will stand the test of time with little hands. Space accommodates a classroom of students who are excited to learn outside. This much needed space offers students an opportunity to enjoy fresh air, explore life sciences, and safely learn in a creative space. This space became even more important as students returned to school wearing masks. Further, this space is the launching point for the larger garden area, which is in motion for this year. Every dollar that you contributed meant the world to us for our students, as well as the community. Thank you for your support in this project, and we look forward to keeping you apprised of our progress. Thank you again, the Grant Watts Parent Organization. As the vice president of this organization, I personally want to thank you. I didn't speak or um, or comment on that grant because I was a part of it, but um, we currently are wrapping up our auction that ends this Thursday. Um, you can make cash donations, or you can purchase packages in time for Mother's Day and have them delivered to you. And thank you for your support. And I have little gifts. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Hogan. Um, well, I'm. Uh, Don't talk unless you've got gifts. Go, go, go. go. No, where are the gifts? The gifts? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, uh, I want to just comment briefly on, 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 on Peter's assertion at the beginning. You know, there is no way that, that, that any in here in this room or it's us against them or them against us. So we just don't think that way. And Scapoose is such a welcoming community. And uh, but I think we also we have to be careful. We don't misconstrue uh, uh, concepts or, or, or verbiage that comes through. Sometimes they get you know uh, citizens that don't really feel that way comes across the wrong way. So. I, I think we have to be careful that we don't misconstrue what sometimes uh, people say. Uh, and sometimes maybe what you and I say, uh, it can be misconstrued. So we have to be careful going down that road. Um, enough said on that. How about we uh, think about the, our sphere, our arts, artistic sphere that we haven't mounted yet. We have a, uh, this is gonna be a 20, uh, 2021 activity uh, as a Betty, Betty Huser commemorative. I like that. Uh, and uh, that, that, you know, it's our, First, our art piece in, 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 in Betty's sense of what a what, what a perfect uh, uh, memory for her. You know, we so uh, I, I I really love that concept. Uh, and then uh, the triptych art piece. Uh, you know, I don't want to give up on that. Uh, and uh, so we've got Michael Curry working on the design. Um, we could conceivably. Uh, uh, have them submit or have someone submit a uh, $5,000 CEP grant and, and maybe we could have some alternative ways of funding that because what a what a neat commemoration for our, for our, for our century uh, is to have that past, present, and future. So let's, let's really kind of turn up the, uh, the thought gears on this and how we might uh, bring this to pass because we don't have to do all the bells and whistles. So instead of, setting, instead of spending 35, maybe we could get by with 18 uh, don't we put the lighting off until uh, five years from now? Uh, but let's not give up on this because you know we've put a lot, a lot of work and energy and sweat into this centennial. And man, what a nice feature of permanent uh, mural of past, present, and future on the on the side of uh, Norm's wall. I think it would be just so cool for the for the August uh, celebration. So let's let's keep our our, our teeth chewing in on this. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I know it was a brief phone call about this grant opportunity, but I don't know about other counselors. I'm not aware of the ins and outs and the details of this project. I don't know if there's a time that could be presented to us or what this looks like. I'm, I'm just, I, I'm in support and I 
it's all for going for the grant. I'm just not quite sure the ins and outs of the project or what the scope is or what the goal is and how we can support that. So if there's a, an opportunity or a time to well, I, I present think, that to I us. think the idea is that my, Michael was going to present that to council. Oh. Um, and so I was going to say my time, but since you brought it up, that I would like to know what the cost of it would be for us to look at doing it anyways. Yeah, grant would have been great. I mean, we got it at the last moment, but why not look at really doing it? And if it's only 35K, I mean, you know, I mean, Jill's going to cringe, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but that's her job. We pay her to cringe. You are talking like it's not that significant. I mean, that's a huge chunk of money. Yeah, I know, but I mean, I'm interested to know more about this. Topic. Well, exactly. And that, I mean, maybe there's alternative routes for us to get funding too. I mean, so. Well, let's should, should we should we move ahead with trying to get uh, the mic? I think that uh, Alex is over there taking notes and going to put this on an upcoming agenda, huh? Um. Well, <laughs> we are uh, at this point. We're pretty far into our budgeting process, so if this is something the coming year that you're actually really wanting to pursue, um, it's not that it's not. You know, not possible, but I do need to go back and we'd have to adjust some things because we do have a draft budget that we're working on ready, you know, that's ready for basically just for in a couple of weeks when we have our <coughs> meeting. So that's not possible, but if it's something you really are all interested in, we would have to move some stuff around and do it quickly. So, well, the, the, all the CEP announcement is, is that out yet? It is. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what, what's the deadline for that? <laughs> 24th. Um, 24th. Yes. Okay. So yeah, that, okay, but I'd, I'd do that. yeah. Why don't we do that? But I'd like to at least know more about it so that maybe we do say not tonight, obviously. I, I would like to have more information on that cost threshold, what we can get it done. Maybe we can get some time labor donations or whatnot to bring that number down. Or maybe you're right. Maybe we do the lighting at a later date. But it would be nice to have well, move I can, forward anyways. Um, Jewel and I had put together a budget for the grant, so we'll just we'll pull that and we'll look at it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Councilor Pauling. First, I'd like to uh, echo what the rest of the council said. Uh, Peter, you know, it takes a lot uh, for people to speak up when they get a feeling that they um, I often am challenged at that point, so I do appreciate that very much. Um, and also, uh, Norm, your team did an amazing job especially with all the issues we have going on uh, nationwide. Um, I commend you and your team very much so. so. Um, I was not, I was actually on vacation, so I was not able to sign the letter that went uh, out from many counselors and community members in regards to the shutting down of our county. I am in strong uh, support of that letter. I just kind of wanted to make that known. I think that our small businesses are hurting already. Restaurants, um, they need all our support that we can. So if you guys and anybody else in the community can support them, please go out there and support them as much as you can. Thank you. Councilor Losowski. Um, yeah, Peter, again, I, I applaud your uh, willingness to stand up and um, share your thoughts with us earlier. Over 30 years ago, um, as, as a child to a single mother who was homeless, and we came into this community of Columbia County to get our footing. And we were, op we were brought, uh, we were welcomed with open arms. We were outsiders of the community, but they quickly uh, provided me with a space uh, to feel as though I was a part of a, a new place. And so I do feel as though our culture is um, to be open and inclusive of our community and our community members. And so again, I say thank you, Peter, for taking the time to share that because I think that those words were very powerful that you shared. Um, Chief, as everyone said, your team did a fantastic job in creating a, a safe community. And uh, we are very proud of that. And I ask that you please let uh, the officers know that we, we truly do appreciate all of their efforts. Um, ballots were sent out. So uh, 
make sure you get yours and uh, hopefully fill those out and return them uh, before the 18th, I believe, I want to say. And then uh, lastly, yes, the Community Enhancement Program grant applications will be due uh, the 24th of this month. So I do recommend uh, local nonprofit organizations and groups uh, provide an application uh, so that we can help support uh, the local community. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you. Uh, long couple of weeks. So the first thing we, Columbia County Economic Team had the strategic planning session a week ago Friday at in Klatskanai. At the Klatskanai, they've got a nice little meeting room that they have that where we were able to do a socially distanced work session. Uh, it went really well. I think that we're going to have some a good set of strategic goals for economic development countywide. And it was a good event. Um, second thing was, as you know, everyone we moved back into extreme risk. Uh, I signed the letter that Mr. Poling talks about. I also got an email from the governor's office asking for input this week after the announcement. And I let them know how I felt. It was my opinions. Uh, the first thing, you know, she claimed that she was trying to save lives, and I pointed out that she could have saved more lives by not changing the order of people and making sure that seniors and those with comorbidities got the shot first before politically connected groups. Um, and then I called her out on coming to Scapoose when it wasn't when she wasn't in line. She wasn't eligible to get the vaccine. She was 60 years old, and even if she does have comorbidities, which I don't know because that's a HIPAA thing. She doesn't qualify, and I know that because I'm in the same age group. I know the day that I became eligible, and she got it a couple weeks before that. So I called her out on that, and I was actually horrified by the response from the governor's office. They, the governor's office responded, she brought her own vaccine with her. And so then I queried, did she bring a vial of the Johnson Johnson vaccine? What happened to the other four doses that come in a single vial of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine? And they respond, we gave it to four seniors in your community. And it, what bothers me is it's such a unbelievable statement to make to come out of the governor's office that I just, it, you know, I brought up things like the data, what we know today versus what we knew a year ago. The fact that businesses have, Restaurants have invested in hospital grade air purification systems, ways to make sure that the airflow works in their thing. These things that we know reduces the ability of the virus to rep, you know, to transmit. You know, hundreds of these places have garage door openings or big windows that can open that create the same flow as if you're outside. Yet there was no consideration. It's just shut them all down. And it's just, it doesn't make sense. We went through this whole thing. If we all remember back when they were talking about recreational, outdoor recreational spaces, which we really now know based on the data that outdoors, you really don't need to wear a mask unless you're within close coordinates with other people that are unvaccinated for a long amount of time. But we can't, you know, they wanted us to put observers to make sure people were six feet apart. But we, today we know the data is there, but they still haven't bothered to update that. These things should change frustration with government and the slowness if I get, but I just want to let you guys know that that interaction that happened and it was, I, you know, I just listed out those type of things. You know, look, if a, why don't we just say they have to have their doors and we need the circulation. The circulation is the most important thing for indoor besides keeping people separate. You know, and it just, it didn't make any sense that we're just, we're knee jerking to like we were a year ago without the knowledge we have today. You know? But I don't get to make those decisions. Hopefully when this is all over, we'll have a legislature that decides that they need to take a harder look at the uh, emergency clauses in the state of Oregon and that there's more input and activity from the elected legislature than there currently is within the system because my conversations with our state senators when this was implemented it was never foreseen to be done for a pandemic it was more 
an earthquake or some sort of natural disaster. So beyond that, it's been good. And uh, I do have my second shot. And, you know, I like to say this, that the, the data coming back on these mRNA vaccines are through the roof incredibly, it's you know, like a miracle within a year. And the data coming from out of like Israel, where they've got 60% people vaccinated and cases are through the floor. The UK, where they've got their ahead of us, cases are through the floor. You know, we're kind of, Oregon's kind of the outlier right now in the United States where cases are through the floor. So we know the path and it's just a matter of, you know, trusting people that it's the right thing to do. So anyways, if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and the meeting. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>